Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Wednesday, April 17th, 2024. Good, as always, to have you on board, everybody. Today's show is sponsored by Valletta Industries. Today's episode is brought to you by Valletta Industries. Valletta Industries is a premier maritime and tactical training company founded and comprised of former U.S. Navy SEALs. They offer best-in-class trainers for the Department of Defense and local law enforcement. The Valletta team has a passion for instructing and continuing to support the mission of active duty personnel and first responders by lending their hard-earned experience to those brave Americans who still serve. If you're a government contractor looking for a great partner for your next big project, Valletta Industries is an SBA-certified HUBZone and SDVOSB company. Valletta Industries, we solve problems. To learn more, go to www.vallettaindustries.com. My guest today is Vice Admiral Peter Godier, U.S. Coast Guard. He is the Deputy Commandant of Operations for the, uh, for the Coast Guard. Admiral, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Bill. It's great to be here. Great to have you back at the Naval Institute. Uh, so first off, I want to talk about what's going on in the Port of Baltimore. So the, a couple of weeks ago, the motor vessel Dolly had an elision with uh, the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Big disaster, national news. Um, Describe for our listeners the unified command structure, because there's a lot of people reacting to that event, um, it, you know, and how that uh, is being addressed, and, and what's the Coast Guard's role in it? Certainly. Well, I mean, starting off just acknowledging the tragedy um, that happened three weeks ago, um, early on a Tuesday morning. Um, actually, one of the very positive things is how this, how well this response has actually gone. And in large part, um, it's because of the doctrine that we have here in the United States in terms of how we respond to disasters, how we respond to emergencies. So the Unified Command, as we call it, um, consists of the United States Coast Guard on the federal side, plus the Army Corps of Engineers. On the state side, it's the state police and it's the State Department of Transportation. Um, and then um, the city and the county of Baltimore are very much involved. But in terms of how this works, it, it, the unified command construct enables just right in the outset of a, an emergency and disaster, what have you, for the right agencies with the right capabilities and authorities at the federal, state, and local level to come together just within minutes and form this construct under something we call the incident command system. Um, which is in the plans and doctrines for the United States. So we got off to a really effective start, beginning with the search and rescue case, as, as we well know, which then turned into body recovery, um, recovery of the human remains, which is being led by the Maryland State Police in okay. the Unified Command. Mm. Um, and sort of as the objectives have shifted in terms of um, the priorities, as we, as we shifted into um, the main objective of opening up the navigation channel, removing the debris, and reopening the Port of Baltimore to vessel traffic, it shifts to um, an Army Corps of Engineers primary thrust where they have the authority in terms of the navigability of our waterways um, mm. throughout the United States. And so you can kind of see here how we have these agencies with slightly different authorities and capabilities that can all come together against a common set of objectives and just make it happen. Who's the quarterback for the, the operation? <laughs> you know, um, so honestly, all the agencies are in charge, and yet no agency singularly is in charge of huh. this. Um, you know, it, it, it helps, I think, that the Coast Guard has sort of broad authority and capability in terms of maritime safety, security, and environmental protection. And whether it be a hurricane or a bridge collapse, whether it be a ship that's having a problem, um, a fire like we saw recently in the port of New York and New Jersey, um, the Coast Guard brings incident management capacity hmm. and just a culture of interagency engagement so we can come in, and we're not really the quarterback, Bill, but I think um, it enables us with our broad authorities and having this incident management muscle memory to come in and then really help be the main coordinating agency. 
Got it. Okay. Um, I, I think that's a good segue to talk about the maritime transportation system, the MTS. Uh, a, a lot of Americans uh, are unaware of just how busy the waterways and the ports and you know, I think this Francis Scott Key Bridge incident showed you know, what happens when a waterway gets blocked, right? The, the, it's Baltimore's the main uh, import port for automobiles coming into the United States uh, on the East Coast. And so that's one of the things that's, you know, a supply chain blockage kind of thing. Um, but without knowing it, I think a, many, every American relies on the MTS, right? Yeah. To some level for our, our gross domestic product, uh, imports, exports, and all that stuff. So what, what is, how would you describe the maritime transportation uh, system? And then how important is it to the, to the U.S. economy? Yeah, Bill, you know, to your point, um, what's been really interesting to us, you know, we're in the fellowship of sea services here, right? Um, represented by U.S. Naval Institute, the Marines, the Coast Guard, the U.S. Navy. Maritime administration. We think about maritime all the time, um, and what is always surprising is um, the realization that with the Dolly incident, people now realize that we have ships up to 1,200 feet long, greater than 95,000 dead weight tons that transit through our waterways, under our bridges, through our communities every single day, and it really isn't until something goes wrong. Yeah. that the general public tends to think about this. Right. Not just Baltimore, think about COVID. Think about the supply chain right. crisis that we had. People then focused on the port of Los Angeles and Long Beach where we had a backup of vessels um, and just challenges in offloading cargoes and th things of that nature. But the reality of it is, to your point, we are really dependent as a nation, as a maritime nation, on the free flow of commerce in the maritime transportation sector. Yep. Um, over 90% um, of our imports and exports happen by sea. Um, there's five trillion, more than $5 trillion of economic benefit every single year to maritime transportation. And it's not just in our coastal ports. It's also in this inland waterway system in Mississippi, the Missouri, the Ohio River, and tributaries that help um, elements of the U.S. economy like farmers deliver their goods uh, through the Western River system, down to New Orleans onto deep draft vessels, and then enables us to have international markets for the things that we produce every single, single day here. It's something that we tend to think about and we take for granted. We right? do in the sea services, we, we, right? Yeah. Well, I think you know, the average American just doesn't think about, think about right. maritime commerce. If you don't see it, you don't think about it. That, that's right. Yeah. And they just, you know, we automatically think that it just, it just happens and it needs to happen. But to that point is tremendously important. Um, and the Coast Guard um, plays a leading role in terms of the safety, security, and environmental protection of our over 360 ports, over our tens of thousands of miles of waterways and coastal areas. Um, but we do this in concert with maritime industry because um, our maritime transportation system is primarily private sector, market driven. Yep. Um, we play a safety security role. We do have regulations that make sure that um, in cooperation and collaboration with these maritime partners that um, everything flows smoothly. Gotcha. Um, so one of the things that I've really enjoyed since being here at the Naval Institute is I've had more exposure to the Coast Guard uh, with the proceedings team. With, with, we're, we're constantly publishing a lot of stuff by Coast Guard uh, officers. Um, and I've learned a lot more about the sort of breadth and depth of all the different mission sets and problem sets that the Coast Guard is tasked with dealing with, right? Um, Top of mind, uh, illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing, uh, climate change, sea level rise, uh, offshore energy, cybersecurity of the ports, uh, autonomous systems, gray zone conflict, deployments to you know, the South China Sea and the, uh, the Persian Gulf. The Coast Guard's everywhere. And I, I, I interviewed uh, Admiral Tiangsen, the the uh, Coast Guard Pacific Area Commander uh, a couple months ago, mm -hmm. and I, I loved his saying, 
um, that his area of responsibility was Dollywood to Bollywood, yeah. Hollywood to Bollywood, right? And, uh, and polar bears to penguins. That's a large area of the globe. Um, so uh, th there, as, as my optimistic fighter pilot friends would say, you, you work in a target-rich environment. Mm -hmm. um, how do you manage all those challenges? And what does it take to lead an organization that has to prior, I mean, the, the Coast Guard's like 40,000 people. It's a small service. How do you lead an organization that has to prioritize and deal with so many big, complex problems? Yeah, it, it's one of the great things about being in the Coast Guard. It's incredibly intellectually stimulating. Um, you know, one day you're thinking about search and rescue and how we're managing that and how, as a program, we're improving our performance um, for the American people. On another day, we'll have a crisis like what we're experiencing in Baltimore. On another day, we're preparing for a hurricane and helping our port partners wind down the maritime transportation system in a location that might be hit and then restarting that after um, landfall of a hurricane in a, in a particular location. We like, as a Title X military organization, think in terms of our national defense. Mm -hmm. And we operate forward in a joint environment to help protect and preserve our American values and the international rule, rules-based order um, every single day. Um, and uh, so it's a wonderful portfolio, but it does, is, to your point, make it really challenging on a day-to-day -day basis um, to manage the whole thing. So you start with priorities, right? Um, we have 11 statutory missions in the Coast Guard, and uh, uh, woe to me to try to list all those things out, but what we try to do is view this in a whole as the Coast Guard as a maritime governance organization. So um, our blend of statutory missions, our capabilities, thinking about how um, these, uh, um, you know, the, the exclusive economic zone or navigable waters or ports and waterways, and then moving out into international waters and our less governed spaces, how we provide maritime governance domestically and then globally. Hmm. Um, and we have of late just realizing that our demands are increasing every single year. The recognition of the Coast Guard as a maritime governance organization is critical, not just to our homeland security under the Department of Homeland Security, right. but also our national defense as a Title X military organization too. It has really forced us to establish priorities. So what we do is we look at sort of fundamentally search and rescue as our principal life-saving, life-sustaining uh, mission set. Th the thing that we're known most for that is something that we have um, uh, a really sacred um, agreement with the American people to keep up and be a no-fail mission. So we need to keep strong in search and rescue. But we just talked about maritime transportation system and what we've affirmed within senior leadership in the Coast Guard is um, making sure that our marine transportation system is available for legitimate use, for the free flow of commerce, for those who use it for fishing and for making their living, and for those who use it for pleasure. Um, that is also a preeminent um, thing for us, whether that be aids to navigation, operating our vessel traffic centers, um, um, our captain of the port roles um, in over 40 um, different locations is an absolute priority. And then moving out, we have counter drug, we have illegal and unreported fishing, as you say, We've got to sort of rationalize all this in any, any given way. But the good thing about it is we're a multi-mission organization. Every cutter, every aircraft, every coastie in any given location is a multi-mission asset to us. And we can just sort of shift and toggle in any given moment, depending on what we're facing, into whatever that mission set is on a priority basis. Okay. All about priorities. Kind of right? hard to wrap your, no, your no, mind it, around, but it, 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 it is, works. But, you know, yeah. It, 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 I, it, again, that that uh, global mission set, right? Uh, Arctic, you know, polar bears to penguins. Um, Eleven different statutory missions, complex and very different, as you mentioned, search and rescue to counter drug to defense. Uh, you know, support to Pentagon, support to national defense and security issues. Um, maritime security, 
uh, ports and waterways, aids to navigation. It's it's a almost a mind-boggling, different, you know, set of of priorities and mission areas. Yeah, and the, and the good news with that is, um, so USNI is steeped in history, right? right. Great, yeah. great organization to just um, examine and lift our our collected naval histories. Well, so. The Coast Guard really started as a conglomerate conglomeration of different agencies that were established right. based on needs. So you start with the, the um, Revenue Cutter Service. Um, um, you know, the, a gleam in the eye of Alexander Hamilton, right? Written into the Federalist Papers. This young country needed a way of collecting revenue from customs. Yep. Um, in, uh, in, in, in our nascent ports in the, um, in the 13 original states, right? So that was the foundation of the, of the Coast Guard. But one of our earliest acts was establishing the aids to navigation, lighthouses, Boston Light, our okay. original light. And so that was a foundational element of the Coast Guard. And then you look at the steamboat Sultana, the tragic um, incident that happened on the Mississippi River when Right at the end of the Civil War, the um, um, Union Army um, uh, individuals who um, were in um, a Confederate um, prison of war camp were being transported back home. The boilers blew up, and over right. a thousand of those Civil War um, soldiers, Union soldiers, perished, which became the foundation for the Steamboat Inspection Service and uh -huh. the basis okay. of our maritime safety okay. mission in the Coast Guard. Um, and so with a succession of these individual agencies established, the Life Saving Service, um, these then all merged into a single whole that is our now modern Coast Guard. Hmm. And it gives us that powerful background, that powerful history with these um, different authorities, Title 10 military, Title 14 law enforcement, Title 50 intelligence, a regulatory authority, and now a cybersecurity agency um, um, that has international affairs, that has intelligence, enables us to just um, be a powerful maritime governance organization that can flex into these different things. And let me just give you a, a, a contemporary example of this. So. We have now home ported a small fleet of fast response cutters, 154 foot long cutters in the Indo-Pacific. We've got three of them in Guam and mm -hmm. three of them in Hawaii. And we intend with the support of Congress on building those out for a number of reasons. One being that Indo-Pacific is a priority for the Coast Guard, is a priority for the military and our own national security. So um, on any given day, one of those fast response cutters is gonna be operating in conjunction with a small Pacific Island nation through a bilateral agreement, and will be helping them to enforce their own fisheries law in their exclusive economic zone. Okay. And then something happens. A boat goes missing in the Federal Federated States of Micronesia, the FSM. This was in the news recently. And um, so we will help um, a country like um, FSM launch a search and rescue case. We will mobilize a Navy P-8, long legs, great search capability, right. that found those individuals on an uninhabited island, and they wrote help on the beach um, out of some pond fronds, right? Yeah. The Navy found them, so we dispatched a fast response cutter to go and recover those individuals. Their boat ran up on a reef, got hold, they got stranded. So uh, we go on the beach and guess what? Um, because of our diverse coasties that operate um, there and worldwide, it turns out that one of the coasties that was crewing that fast response cutter was related to uh, uh, one of those individuals who had been stranded and needed wow. to be rescued. So we bring them on board. Hmm. So we'll do law enforcement, we'll do search and rescue, we'll do international affairs, we'll do national defense operations, all with that same fast response cutter. Got it. Lots of hats. Lots of hats, yep. yeah. Exciting. Um, I want to delve into one of the, the problems and uh, issues that you just described a little deeper. So the president recently signed an executive order that institutes mandatory reporting of cyber incidents or active cyber threats 
endangering any vessel, harbor, port, or waterfront facility. So what does that mean for the Coast Guard? Uh, you know, is this leading to more oversight, more inspections? Do you need more people with cybersecurity skills? How does, how does uh, that EO executive order impact the yeah. Coast Guard? Yeah, all of the above. And um, it's a great intro into the Coast Guard as a cybersecurity agency. Um, and you're here today at the Naval Academy right. for um, a, a, an event on cybersecurity. That's right. Uh, Vice Admiral Ashbach, uh, our, uh, our information warfare preeminent uh, three-star um, in the Naval Services is hosting uh, all of us to just um, you know, sharpen the spear in terms of um, information, warfare, information warfare. Um, so the Coast Guard as a cyber agency has actually three different responsibilities, a little bit different than how, what DOD does. Um, the first is we need to protect our own networks, the Doden, right? And each element, each um, um, military service under US Cyber Command does that check. The second thing that we do is we actually operate in and among cyberspace. We have um, a cyber mission team that's certified under U.S. Cyber Command, operates under their authorities, does offensive operations in that hmm. sense. But here's the unique thing about Coast Guard Cyber. We have an obligation to help the private sector protect and defend themselves in the maritime transportation system. So port facilities, vessels that operate um, in U.S. waters um, need to be cyber secure yep. because they're a critical infrastructure sector and so the Coast Guard helps them do just that. We have cyber protection teams um, that on a voluntary basis can go and help um, private sector entities do things like network mapping, um, do penetration analysis, look for vulnerabilities, even find maybe malicious cyber actors on their, on their um, networks. But here's the thing. Um, we didn't until we had that executive order have real clear authority in terms of protecting ports, protecting vessels when there are cyber threats. That executive order gave us that. So no, a captain of the port um, in over 40 locations where, where, we're, where we have our shore operations, if there's a detection of like say, a uh, ship that's coming in that might have um, a cyber threat, um, we can then direct that ship to take certain actions like move to an anchorage, secure themselves, um, be boarded by the Coast Guard, maybe we can do a joint as assessment to deter determine what the threat of that ship to the maritime tra transportation system might be. But you had mentioned the workforce, and I think we, like other military services, other go government agencies, need to continue to build our people, retain really great folks who have these um, exquisite capabilities, years of training, um, and uh, one of the things that we've done in the Coast Guard to do that is we created a cyber mission specialist rating, a brand new rating in the Coast Guard. So folks can have a real clear, clear um, career track. They can see what their future looks like. We get them the requisite training. Yep. Um, and then we have all the workforce shaping tools to keep them in the Coast Guard. We did that with a warrant specialty too. Mm. And we've hired on a cadre of really great civilians who can provide us the continuity um, and the leadership to help make sure the workforce is strong. So you, you mentioned that the captain of the port authorities and the 40-odd uh, shore facilities around the country that have you know, a captain of the port, um, do, are they likely to have a cyber specialist who, when there is a threat either to the port, the infrastructure, or to a ship that's coming in, who can go out and you know, check out a network, check out sh a shipboard, systems and you know detect viruses detect threats help protect or or, or isolate the threat we I exactly right uh, i think you hit the nail on the head um, each one of our um, nine districts has a civilian a cybersecurity civilian expert and each one of our sectors um, has a, a cyber expert as well that provide us that um, that expertise that continuity somebody that the captain of the port can call on in order to um, get done what needs to be done. But then we also have these, um, I think the way the Coast Guard organizes is, uh, you know, we have frontline sort of generalists, right, that yep. do all these different missions.
but then they can call back for assistance, assistance from these cyber protection teams under Coast Guard Cyber Command, who can then deploy with more advanced capabilities if there needs to be like a network mapping and, and things of that nature. And, and, and uh, um, you know, actually, as an example of this, um, we actually have a cyber specialist who's on the investigation team on the motor vessel Dolly, so we can help rule out whether there was a cyber um, element of that particular casualty. Yeah, I know in the, in the early days after that incident, uh, there was speculation and, you know, there, there's an ongoing investigation and it, from what I'm reading, it doesn't sound like that was caused by any sort of a cyber attack, um, but that's something that has to be thought about, right? Ruled out, investigated, um, and, and you want to make sure that uh, anything in, you know, any future incidents like that aren't caused by um, a cyber attack on the ship's navigation system or you know, other things right. of that nature. It's a, it's a new world, isn't it? So, it is. whereas, you know, in the olden days, when we do an investigation, we'll have somebody who will look at the propulsion system, somebody who will look at the fire suppression and control system, you know, somebody who examines flooding and structural stability and that sort of thing. And now we need to have somebody who knows what they're doing in terms of cyber to rule out those things. Wow. Um, so, we've touched on this certainly already, um, but give us a, a sense of what are the most challenging aspects of your current job. And if you want to talk about any of your previous jobs, because you were the Coast Guard Pacific Area Commander, you also worked on the, the follow-on to the Deepwater Horizon incident, which was that massive uh, oil spill in the, in the Gulf, uh, was that 12, 13 years ago or so. What, what are some of the most interesting, challenging aspects of your career, um, the, the path that you've had and the, and the current job that you have as a DCO. Yeah. Well, it, it can come on you fast and furious, right? Um, like we were just talking on any given day, um, I could be thinking about um, how the Coast Guard needs to improve our proficiency to get ready for um, this amazing transformation in terms of fuel systems um, that are more environmentally sound that might be coming our way to meet uh, a um, carbon neutral fuel um, mandate for commercial shipping by 2050. On uh, another moment, we'll be thinking in terms of, wow, we're getting offshore wind leasing um, um, up in New England and then now in the mid-Atlantic, it's gonna be moving into the Pacific. Also, um, to provide environmentally friendly fuel um, energy sources. But we need to make sure that we have offshore sea lanes or fairways so that ships can still transit safely right. as industry is now putting up these Eiffel Tower sized um, wind turbines out there. Um, and then we need to be thinking in terms of, you know, malicious behavior in terms of China in uh, um, uh, Southeast Asia and what the Coast Guard can do in order to do our part as part of the joint force in order to get after that problem set about operating in the Arctic. Um, so it's an incredibly diverse portfolio. But you know, as a guy who doesn't actually run operations, as a guy who runs policy and capability um, and strategy for the Coast Guard, I think our real challenge is uh, within the cycle of the OODA loop that keeps getting tighter and tighter and tighter in this really dynamic world that we live in, it's providing the operational commanders with the capabilities that they need for these increasing challenges. And I think I share this challenge with my DOD counterparts. Um, when you look at how we budget in the US government, in the US military, where we're looking out two, three years, and then you know, sort of drawing a line in the sand, and then um, the budgets actually come, and they come like mid-year, yeah. fiscal year, and they're different than what you want. Um, and what you would hope for, and now you need to flex into how am I going to adjust my capability appetite based on what I actually get. And yet technology is driving capabilities and the threats at a much, much higher rate than that. It's figuring out how within the budget cycle that we can help operational commanders with things like unmanned systems. So an example of that is finding a little bit of money in a given fiscal year to field things like sail drones. Um, and we're operating sail drones, which are unmanned surface vessels that are sensor equipped, 
um, off the north coast of Haiti in order to sense ah. and deter the potential for okay. a surge in flow. Yep. And we're working with Four Fleet that's doing a lot of great things um, and, and, and Fifth Fleet is and other fleets around, right. um, around the world in terms of integrating unmanned systems and um, improving our ISR. And then the mesh networks necessary to provide the operational decision maker the right information at the right time. Um, it's things like fielding more advanced drones on Coast Guard cutters. And we've been doing really well with the Scan Eagle system on our national security cutters. But we need to be thinking in terms of um, you know, other sensors, other capabilities that might improve um, the decision space for our, our operational commanders. Are you putting smaller like quadcopters on on small boats or smaller, uh, you know, like the response cutters, that kind of thing? We are, and um, I think what we're realizing is we just need to give permission to our frontline operational commanders to do things like buy the small hmm. drones for whatever purpose they think that they might have, other that might be beneficial to them. Um, we've been doing some testing of um, some drones off of fast response cutters. The challenge here is that we need these detect and avoid systems when we fly drones, especially in US airspace, so we meet the FAA rules. Right, right. That's kind of maturing. Um, and our research and development center is, um, is working um, to try to get us to a place where um, um, we, can, we can, that can just be ubiquitous, right? Because yeah. we see the future where we can improve our operational performance by fielding drones like that too. We're thinking about how do we provide better systems for our shore-based operators in our command centers across our sectors and in our districts. And um, so we fielded this thing called Sextant, which uses ESRI, sort of the foundational ubiquitous GIS-enabled systems for our frontline operators. So they, they can then take these layers of data that they can find locally hmm. and then layer those into a common platform, a single pane of glass, I think is the term of art here. So they can take all these different data feeds and they can say, okay, um, I know that I have a fishing season in such and such a month. I know that my fishing vessels are out here. I can tell if there's somebody who isn't emitting, ah. right? And so maybe I, go, I need to go send a small boat or a cutter out there to board that uh, individual because maybe they're not going to be in compliance with our mm. domestic fisheries laws. It's working with National Geospatial Intelligence Agency with all the great space-based geo-intelligence capabilities there. And the AI that they're using and trying to figure out how we can integrate those in a way that's meaningful to our Coast Guard operational folks. And then of course there's artificial intelligence, right? And um, that is just, you know, making leaps and bounds that our budget cycle just doesn't accommodate. Yeah, uh, so I hear a couple things there. The budget cycle is, is always lags technology and, and in, in many cases lags the adversary. Uh, the, uh, the legal, um, you know, the laws of our country, the legal framework and the, uh, uh, the rules that by which we play also tend to lag technology. Technology comes and then Congress or governing agencies realize, oh, we need to have rules and regulations or laws to, to govern how we use that technology, whereas others may not, uh, other nations may not be so worried about the legal structure as, as they are about getting the, the new technology out there. Uh, so that's, those, are, those are daunting challenges. Yeah, they're, they're daunting, but they're also righteous. Uh, what you just mentioned, Bill, though, um, reminds me of, um, our Coast Guard principles of operations. We got a set of seven principles of operations. And so in this, in this rapidly changing world, it's always good to just fall back on basic principles. And so um, these help guide us in terms of the um, princi principle of unity of effort. What we just talked about in Baltimore in terms of unified command. So that's a Coast Guard coxswain in a small boat that might be operating with a state um, law enforcement agency, and just doing a handshake, right, uh, in terms of I'm doing this, you're doing that on field. But the final principle of operation is the principle of restraint. 
because we have very powerful law enforcement authorities that stem from those days of Alexander Hamilton. In fact, Alexander Hamilton um, wrote a note to the first commanding officers in the Revenue Cutter Service that said, be mindful that you are, um, that uh, Americans um, have just essentially thrown off the yoke of tyranny and um, do not like overbearing law enforcement agencies, right? So we need to be mindful of yeah. always following the That's law. That's a great point. Yeah. Um, at the same time and doing the things that we need to do. Yeah. It makes me think, uh, you know, in the Navy, before we go visit a, a foreign port, there's always in-depth briefings about the port, about the culture of the people that you're going to go, and the, and the constant reminder that you all, all of us sailors, are diplomats, right? We're, when we're in a foreign port, we're diplomats. And I, I hadn't thought until just now, when you just said that, that for the Coast Guard, because of your law enforcement aspect, right, you're interacting with Americans on the waterways, and so you're almost diplomatic envoys to the U.S., uh, to, to American citizens, right? So it's a little bit of, I want to keep you safe, I want to make sure you're following the laws, but I also, to, to your point, it's got to be a deft touch. Yeah, um, be mindful that Americans are freemen, right. is the way that Alexander Hamilton couched that. Hmm. But you know, it drives a culture in the Coast Guard operationally that just makes us great collaborators. Mm. I think um, as an agency that has humble uh, resources, I think um, we learn from a very young age to reach out, partner, set common objectives with others, and um, just team up in ways that we can't, uh, that, that are much more effective than just operating by ourselves. That's great. Uh, any questions I you wish I'd asked or, <laughs> or, or saved rounds, parting shots from you, sir? Well, this is a great conversation, Bill. I really appreciate it here. But I think, you know, sitting on the campus, um, this great USNI headquarters here in the campus of Annapolis and the Naval Academy, um, we think all the time, too, about being joint force. And USNI continues to focus on the joint warfighting concept how we prepare ourselves for potential conflicts of the future. Coast Guard is also very much in that. And um, one thing that we don't think about often enough is, as we think about away, as we think about joint war fighting in theaters of operation, we need to remember that we have to be prepared for all domain conflict, not just in the Indo-Pacific, not just in space, not just in cyberspace, but domestically. And so um, a number of us Coasties have been reading history about World War II, about what the home front looked like. And the Coast Guard took on huge responsibilities in terms of maritime security in World War II at the captain of the port level in terms of preserving our safety and security and defense in the homeland. So we've got to think both mm -hmm. theater conflict domestic preserving our own safety and security because um, if there are domestic attacks on the homeland that is going to drive things um, in terms of what the military will be doing that's a great point uh, you know the the deep space the deep battle space uh, for the western pacific is is still is back here it's conus right uh, on our side uh, and the ability of an adversary these days with uh, information, with cyber weapons, uh, and with uh, operatives, because we are a you know, free and open country where there's lots of folks who come to the United States, and live in the United States from foreign you know, overseas countries. And you're making a, a very good point about the ability to project power is very much dependent on your security situation at home. Uh, that's a good point about the, the Coast Guard's role in making sure that the deep battle space back here uh, remains uh, viable, uh, operating, that all of our systems that help us project power forward uh, can continue to do that. Logistics, yeah. informational, all of those things. That's a good point. Coast Guard's going to play a big role. We, uh, we, we have, uh, you said, we wear many hats, but we've got feet 
in many different areas. Yeah. Um, Coast Guard, U.S. Merchant Marine, National Guard, NORTHCOM, DOD. We'll, we're all going to have a role here in the homeland. Well, 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 lots to think about today, sir. Um, that wraps up another episode of the Proceedings Podcast. My, my guest today has been Vice Admiral Peter Godier. He is the Deputy Commandant for Operations of the U.S. Coast Guard. Sir, thanks for stopping by. This was a really great conversation. Yeah, thanks very much. This is terrific. Thanks for hosting me. Our show today was brought to you by Valletta Industries. Today's episode is brought to you by Valletta Industries. Valletta Industries is a premier maritime and tactical training company founded and comprised of former U.S. Navy SEALs. They offer best-in-class trainers for the Department of Defense and local law enforcement. The Valletta team has a passion for instructing and continuing to support the mission of active duty personnel and first responders by lending their hard-earned experience to those brave Americans who still serve. If you're a government contractor looking for a great partner for your next big project, Valletta Industries is an SBA-certified, HUBZone, and SDVOSB company. Valletta Industries, we solve problems. To learn more, go to www.vallettaindustries.com. Until next episode, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.